It feels lonely thinking about death in December with the shroud of the clouds around one's house. In the park, the menacing light beneath the trees, every kind of the dead walking around the town. One with a fish that he helplessly mourns for with a fisherman's tears. One with a bird in distress that he carries close to his heart, his defunct heart. One with a word that has lost its object, the abandoned words that a body shakes off. The body whose blood runs away from its brain, the body whose heart is cold as a knife, confined amongst the stars we scream from inside the coffin. The words die on our lips. The body is an animal that is to die. In wild grief, I suddenly recall the Garden of Eden, the open wounds of the graves, the zinc watering can, the metal vase, the rack behind the stone, and the autumn swirl of the starlings and squalls through the air. The swirl where the world of the dead and the non-dead meet in the consolation of the great inconsolable. Write about death. Describe it in a poem, what you feel concerning death. In the face of death, I am like an animal, and the animal can die, but can write nothing. Try to write a poem about death. Does death have any meaning? What, now that the apples fall so far from the tree of knowledge, that they are not eaten out of inclination, and not out of hunger, but out of tired desire? Death is alone. Now that the apples look like models of apples, ideal apples without blemish, now that the worm may gnaw in the breast of other than human children, death is repressed. Take death by the hand, give it an apple, go over to its grave and take a bite of the apple first. And the words die like flies, their corpses everywhere swept away from the white paper, give the dirt a little room. That which is newborn is like a supernatural creature that only when stricken with illnesses looks like a human child. Give us room to love a mortal form of immortality. Like the depths lift the water up to a source, death lifts the living up to drink. That's part of a longer poem by Danish poet Ingers Christensen. The title of the poem is Poem About Death. Good evening, my name is Charles Carr and welcome to Philly Loves Poetry, a collaborative program between the Moonstone Art Center of Philadelphia and Philly Gen. The focus of our program is to give our viewers and our listeners the experience of the rich culture of poetry in the city of Philadelphia. So tonight, just taking it from the opening poem that I read, uh, our theme for our program tonight is the poetry of grief. And we have a wonderful, remarkable poet who uh, has joined us tonight, somebody I've known for several years. I'm familiar with her work. And her name is Amy Small McKinney. Amy po Amy's poems have been published in numerous journals, for example, Connotation Press, the American Poetry Review, the Indianapolis Review, Anomaly, and the Pedestal Magazine, to just name a few. Amy has also been a guest editor for Pedestal Magazine. Her poem, Birthplace, received special merits recognition by the Comstock Review for their 2019 Muriel Craft Daily Poetry Contest. Amy's second full-length book of poems, Walking Toward Cranes won the Kithara Book Prize in 2016 and was published by Glass Lear Press. Her poems have also been translated into Romanian and Korean. Amy has an MS in clinical neuropsychology from Drexel University and an MFA in poetry from Drew University. Amy resides in Philadelphia where she teaches community poetry workshops and private students. So welcome, Amy. It's uh, wonderful to have you on tonight. Um, I've been to do this program for 
a while and I'm just glad I finally was able to book you to get on to do this. Um, so Amy, I wanted to start our program tonight by making reference to an essay that I read uh, not too long ago, uh, an essay that was written by poet Joy Katz. And the uh, title of the essay is Left Behind, Can Poetry Comfort the Grieving? Uh, so in this essay, uh, Amy uh, or Joy is really describing the struggle that she had in writing poems after the death of her mother. And she uh, really reviewed in the essay all the challenges that she faced in confronting different versions of the way people speak about uh, grief. And at the end, she said she was reading uh, a chapter from a book of etiquette on condolences, which really helped her to see grief in a very different way. And also, uh, she also, uh, went to view a play, the famous play of Eurydice, and she arrived at a very different place approaching the poetry of grief. And I just want to quote, uh, it's pr pretty much the end of this essay, quote, for me, the vital part of grieving was not to try to resolve across this distance. It was the distance. Eurydice led me back to poetry because it is not an elegy. It is about being left behind. I began to think there could be a poem about death that was as large as this distance, or that a poem about death might enact a failure of language that seemed to me the truest part of my mother's absence. In the years since, I have found poems in which I can take my remnant grief. It took me a while to sense what kind of writing I could trust with it, because my relationship to poetry was shifting. Owing to my mother's death, I had become uneasy with closure and impatient with poems that offer epithetic truths, poems of sorrow, especially needed to do something else. The ones that sustain me, I find, have to do with living people, humans who mourn rather than with the departed. These poems are not like grieving, they are not lamentations, but instead open up the isolating process of mourning. They translate sorrow through poetic form rather than confining it to a metaphor. So having said that and, um, you know, realizing that you have, you know, a body of work that deals with this uh, uh, title of grief, uh, can you can you share with uh, our audience, you know, how you come into this topic, uh, whether this has been an ongoing thing or it's been more recent uh, because of what ha has happened in your life? First of all, I'd like to say that I, I understand what, what she said, um, that I, I should, after my husband Russell died, I couldn't, I couldn't read poetry for a while. I found any any poetry that was storytelling or about the person who had died or any closure just made me angry. Doesn't mean it wasn't brilliant poetry. It was like I couldn't hear it at the time. Um, there were only a few poets I could read, but to get, I'm sorry, I, to, to answer your question, um, I began writing about this when my husband Russ um, became quite ill and I was the uh, full-time caregiver. And I didn't have a plan for it. Um, I would run out of the room after caring for him and run to my laptop and just pretty much let the poem say whatever it had to say. Mm -hmm. it, was, it was my safe place. It wasn't safe at all, of course, but it felt safe because I was just being a vessel for what had to be said. And I continued this when he was dying actively and since he's died. And I, I hadn't planned this. It's, it was a surprise, to say the least. But it was the only thing I could do. And there was a poem. There's a poem by um, Liesel Mueller 
And my friend Leonard Gontarek actually sent it to me. And I was finally ready to hear poetry a little bit, read a little bit of poetry. And there's a line that she says, and placed my grief in the mouth of language, the only thing that would grieve with me. And mm -hmm. I think that's what, um, that's what I found myself doing without a plan. Mm -hmm. So when you, you know, you cross that bridge from being the caretaker and the anticipation, you know, someone who was really very sick uh, to this new place, how did that change over come? I mean, how is it expressed from that? In other words, you're, you're, you're really in the throes of really helping to keep someone alive and now you're in a whole new dimension. How, so now, how do the poems come to you? Through the whole process, they basically have always come to me the same way. Um, and, but especially after his death. Sometimes I, I, I feel physically some urgency and I will sit down and, and put my fingers to the keyboard without any knowledge of what it is I want to say and write out the poem. Mm -hmm. Recently, some of the poems have been almost intact. Mm -hmm. Others, have, but of course, I edit eventually to translate it from my private to the to the community, to others, but they really come from a place inside me that I'm not familiar with, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Sure. Uh, so I, I, I would ask you, um, so you're really involved in this genre of poetry, not quite a genre uh, of poetry, but I mean, your poetry uh, before this had dealt with a broad spectrum of reality and maybe unreality. Um, can you speak to that also? I mean, what? Ha where was the shift? How much of a shift do you feel? In other words, if I was reading one of your poems that have come out of this grief, I'd say, "Well, oh geez, I don't, I don't know. That's an Amy poem." Whereas the other poems, I say, "Yeah, I know that's an Amy poem." Do you feel there has been that kind of shift, or are there shifts um, that you go through? The only, well, the only shift that I, I sense, and I'm still in the midst of it, it's hard to see the forest for the trees when you're in the middle of it. Mm -hmm. The only shift I sense is that I'm giving myself more permission to just absolutely listen, almost, I mean, this sounds so pretentious, but almost like this, the poem is speaking to me and I am just, I'm taking dictation. Mm -hmm. I think in many ways there, there's still it's still my voice, and I think people can will recognize it. There are certain things that I have done and not and have not done and have done with my poems that are still contained in these new poems. I think. Mm -hmm. So, do you see this as a you know as a vehicle for anyone? Uh, you don't have to be quote unquote, calling yourself a poet, yes. but this is really a platform that one can come through the, you know, the tunnel of grief. Yes. And, you know, you don't know where you're going to end up, but you're, it's, it's a pathway. For me, language, the private, the, the uh, deep, la deep language of uncertainty and lack of resolution of my poetry was the only way I could go. But I think there are so many ways to do this. Some people are bakers. Some people, I have a friend who's knitting after her husband's death, making beautiful objects out of all kinds of visual, it's just knitting plus. Mm -hmm. um, but I do think for many people, Language the, is is a way uh, of going through this. It, it's it's a it can be journaling, 
Um, you know, I, I was teaching a, a wonderful group for about five years, and I would always have us lock our sensors in the closet or outside the room. And they'd always surprise themselves with discovery. And many of these people were memoir writers, not poets. Mm -hmm. uh, I think anyone can do this. You don't have to be writing. Most, in my mind, good poems of social grief begin as personal grief that they're compelled by a deep personal grief before they become somehow translated into the grief for others. So I think anyone can do that. They don't have, I, yeah, I don't think you have to be a poet to do this. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. There are so many ways to put this impossible thing to talk about into some container. Mm -hmm. Now you've run workshops on this very topic mm -hmm. and the members of this workshop um are there people that are dealing with this in a not in an immediate way but it are dealing with it in a long-term way
bigger things about the world and about nature and about things passing, things dying. Do you feel that we're somehow overall in a state of, you know, grieving? Yes. I think that there's a deep social grieving going on and getting back to that workshop, some of my students did um, end up talking about some of that. I mean, we're when you're grieving someone you love, you're trying to reach through a distance that's impossible to reach. Here we are doing COVID, trying to reach through a distance on this machine. Mm -hmm. I think people are grieving on so many levels. For some people, loved ones and friends have died of COVID. For some people, the hurricanes, the fires, the earth. I mean, there's upheaval where what once felt safe and secure is gone. And I, and I think that this is social grief that can be written about, not as an occasional poem, not as a poem like about an occasion, like a COVID poem, but if you mm -hmm. begin to talk about the isolation that you're experiencing personally, it will. It can be translated into social grief. I'm sure of it. Other people mm -hmm. get it. Mm -hmm. I think there's an intersection right now between personal and social grief that is just it's breathtaking. Mm -hmm. Are there other poets who, you know, really draw you into this and that? I won't use the word model, but they've been an inspiration to you. And, and I, I ask that because on all my shows, I like to know the names of these poets so that our audience with their, can sit there with a pen and pencil and jot them down and, and, and maybe reference some of their poems or even buy their books of poems. Well, I, my mother and my father poets. Oh were, no, not my mother and father, my mother and father poets in the poetry world, <laughs> mm -hmm. um, were Jean Valentine and James Wright. And I was thinking about both of them, and I was thinking how James Wright, using a lyric voice, could address social concerns and, and deep isolation like we're going through now, while also talking about the everyday person in Ohio, but wasn't exactly storytelling. There was a mystery to his work. And, and one writer called it pastoral surrealism. Mm. Um, Jean Valentine said that certainly I'm always working with things that I don't understand, with the unconscious, the invisible, and trying to find a way to translate it. Her lyric poem, someone said, delve into dream lives with glimpses of the personal and political. And I've, I have turned to her, her poems right after Russ's death. She was the only poet I could read, mm -hmm. stand to mm -hmm. read. So yeah. those two poets, um, have, I mean, they're just in me. And they were my initial models, my first models. Mm -hmm. So uh, as a poet and as an artist, you've been published. What is your next step, uh, both with this and well, just with your poetry in general? You know, Charles, um, I struggle a little bit with the poetry biz, if you know what I mean. The right. Marketing, publishing, I find that very difficult. Um, but writing is something I do every single day of my life. And if I don't do it, it's, I'm, not, I'm not functioning. It's like breathing. Mm -hmm. Now, these particular poems, poetry, that it came out of some, I don't know, wonderful, unsurprising place, I suddenly realized I have enough for a chapbook. Mm -hmm. I didn't plan a chapbook. But I'm looking at them and I'm going, my goodness, I think this is a book. So that's, I kind of function that way. I don't say I'm going to write a book, uh -huh. but I'm writing. And in that process of writing and in the excitement of editing, mm -hmm. 
working on the, on the poem, sometimes I go, oh, okay, I think this is a book. Uh -huh. I do have a, a third manuscript that's been out and about looking for a home. And it, it hasn't found a home yet. And there's a few things about it that somehow trouble me still, actually. Mm -hmm. The poems I'm working on now, I, I rarely say, and you, I think you know this about me, oh, I'm excited, or this is, I think this is strong work. If anything, I'm <laughs> going to doubt myself. Yeah. But I, there's something about this work that feels very important to me. So I think that's my next step, a book. Mm -hmm. Isn't it always uh, maybe great to be a little bit self-effacing as a, an artist <sighs> and to, to, doubt your, to doubt yourself uh, and, and not to a, to a point where you completely back away from this, but you have that, that voice in you um that's kind of pecking away at you do you do you have that i've had that voice for so many years that i am excited to say shut up to it now mm -hmm. and take myself seriously uh -huh. i've been extremely hidden poet who didn't feel she was good enough i believe that we need two voices we need the voice that says you can keep going this isn't good enough keep going, go press further. What about this image? This is after the non-censoring, whatever this thing I do. Right. And another voice that said, okay, okay, girlfriend, stop your bullshit, mm -hmm. get it out, publish it. So I think that you have to have both of those voices. Mm -hmm. Otherwise you're arrogant and missing the problems with your work or yourself so self-effacing that you never publish. I think mm. it's a very difficult balance poets and artists have to work with. Yeah. Uh, just as an aside, I'm stunned with some poets that I actually know. <laughs> I think you might know oh, that are not published. I mean, I'm just floored with it because <laughs> every time I read their poem, I you know kind of scratch my head and I say, well, where's your book? And because you're 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 kind of depriving the world of something that's really precious, and so, that's the balance. Don't wait, yeah. to, don't wait forever. Don't I, don't right. be long. This is, and you can't. You know, I read these wonderful poets, and then I'll say, um, I, I read a Paul Salon today. He's another one that I love, and uh -huh. I'm never writing again. Well, of course. <laughs> you have to write again. You must, you can't mm -hmm. let that stop you. So, yes, I, I'm rooting some people on right good, now. Good, good. Glad to. Mm -hmm. So, speaking about poetry, the writing of poetry, we can discuss that, but we also want to hear your poems. And that's, uh, that's a real treasure, and we're waiting to, to hear you read your poems. So, the floor is yours, the stage is yours. Okay, the floor is mine. And you can explain, Amy, we have plenty of time. You can explain some background to these poems, you know. I, I'd like to, but let me let me know. Um, sure. Yeah, okay. Yeah. I tried to time, but it's not my um, strong suit. So I'm going to begin with a poem that... Um, was written when he was first entering the stage of, of severe illness. Um, and I'm not, I don't know the Turkish language, or if I mispronounce it, I'm sorry, but what I dream about when you are in the hospital, the fabric made of eggshells at a bridal shop, then it's not. I'm already married to you then my father beside me. And though his body's missing, he moves over a flame like a bridge, alive at our wedding. And banquet tables wait like surgeons, and lights dim and brighten like missiles. I try to understand how to live without you. As I try to understand, even in the dream, how in the Turkish city of Gajintef, a bomb explodes in the middle of a wedding. 
The video shows the bride dancing and then screaming, and then she's not. When I wrote this poem, I hadn't planned to put in, include social grief, but sometimes as I'm talking about personal grief, the world and the voices of others make themselves heard, and I'm glad. Um, this poem was, again, when I was caregiving and feeling pretty helpless as a caregiver. Tending to living things. There must be a way, but all I know to do is throw my white dishes rimmed with blue orchids across a room until all that I have is broken except for one self-sufficient succulent, I don't know how to make anything live. There must be a way, but I don't know how. I want to bury myself inside the dark, stand inside invented light. While the world falls apart, my husband's brain swells with lakes. Pink roses that sprawl across the apartment building's metal fence don't need me. I'm not their caregiver of blossoming. Grief does not ask me to be pretty, does not ask me to be a corsage pinned to a gown. It wants me to push up from roots it scarcely survived, enter its plain door. I want to push my husband in his wheelchair along our rutted road as though travelers joy. Clematis, Vitalba, scrambling a lattice fence to flower next year. I wrote this just um, a few days before I, I, felt, I felt he was dying. He had entered hospice. During the pandemic, Oh, I just want to mention that he died June 28th and took, took sick during the plant pandemic. And I got him out of the rehab as the doors were closing. So fa from family coming in. During the pandemic, you were dying at home. Sparrows nibble at your blanket, dive in and out of the eaves of your mouth. Wings rimmed with tatting, tattooed beaks add color to an otherwise bland room. The hard working birds will not speak to me yet. This is not the life I planned. Now the sky closes its doors and trees shrink into fetal positions. Your body shrinks. You forget where you are, where you are going. Your hospital bed tries to explain, you don't belong here anymore. This is not the life we planned. We are breezeless, our window won't open. I wait for the sparrows for a I wait with the sparrows for a sign to kiss your confused mouth goodbye. You say I'm moving three across, three down. What if my pee is poison? Get me my shoes. The doctor said we need
jump a little bit. It's in sections and I'm gonna take a breath so you know there's a change. It has no title, but it begins with a line from Jean Valentine from her poem, The Messenger. You were going to go without me. That was always your story. The human body as dead weight, the body unable to stand or walk or lift itself, reason and home disappearing. You wanted to go to the bank. You wanted to pick up a Sunday paper for a rental app. You wanted to be certain we moved somewhere safe. You are not in our bedroom anymore. The shelves on the other side of the room that hold photos were not shelves. You told me I am moving three over and three down. Or pointed to a photo of your dead parents and told our daughter, they are playing pinnacle. You told our daughter the exact number of your bridge master points, but insisted you still could walk. There were things about dying I didn't expect. How the dying stop pissing and shitting, and then suddenly whatever is left inside is released, flung out like birds from a rotting cage. How the dying will stop breathing, then a gasp again, open their eyes, then no breath, find Must be what is meant by taking a last gasp. It must be what is meant by birds on a wire before migration. I keep telling you to come home, enough is enough. I wake in the middle of the night afraid, sleep with a light on as I did when young. What am I afraid of? Aloneness does not have a body. It does not have a gun. It cannot creep beneath the door frame. Still, what I see is a figure, a man, and he is moving in and out of my room at night. It is not you. Were it you, I would not be afraid. Maybe I need to open my eyes to the comfort of your dark. Not yet. I dreamed our clothes were back a massive cloth, and he was there to help. Shirts were scattered across his closet floor, and I am alone. It feels exhausting to place them one by one on wire hangers. Wrinkle-free, cotton, flannel, still here with me. I imagine little birds nesting in this closet now instead of moths. I imagine the toxic mothballs are snowflakes. Sometimes I'm handing over tax forms. Sometimes I live in a forest that is red and yellow and trees chattering to themselves. Then I return to the accountant and the lawyer and the fallen shirts. All I can do, shuttling back and forth between nests and concrete, metal and leaves. In the car today, I asked you how I looked in my new dress. I told you I don't want to live without you, and you took my hand. Air has its own shape. It is solid if you know where to look. It opens its doors if you know where to walk in. This is the place I love most. That was written very um, soon after his death when I was afraid. That's changed a quite, quite a bit now. Okay, I'm okay with time, Charles. Yeah, you're fine. Thank you. Okay. This is a very short poem I wrote shortly after he died. After you died, my mouth crammed with creatures and tears, frogs raining from its blue water spout to reach the sycamore's thin plates breaking from its bark. Mouth as river vein, after all, returns blood to a heart. Mm. The next poem I'm going to read has three repeat, uh, same repeated line three times. It comes from the glorious Sarah Vaps, of the poet Sarah Vaps book, Winter. 
And the line is, I can't stop thinking that slash from no, Noemi, N-O-E-M-I Press. I recommend it. Mm -hmm. This poem is again, again. I can't stop thinking that I will never swim again. I have unlearned the strokes to keep my head above the water. You held me above the wave while you sunk below, knew I was afraid, that I am afraid of everything out there. I can't stop thinking that the sycamore you loved by our window will smack into the glass that protects me now that you are gone, that I am a gold yellow leaf, a leaf falling into the dumpster below, sinking into guilt and confusion. I can't stop thinking that I will wake tomorrow, not a leaf, but a bear, a bear wandering into the wrong world, searching for a stream. I crouch over my cub, hold her. She will not drown. Mm. Thank you. Um, there's a poem I'd like to include that was not about him. It was, um, it was in the middle, beginning of the COVID. I was thinking about my dad who had died and he was a fierce guy with a very large heart. Um, and it's called, What Do I Know About Crickets? What do I know about crickets? Is it their season of silence? They are silent tonight. Is it because the world is ending? If my father were a cricket, but he is dead, were he a cricket anyway, I would open a window to hear him, his thunderous volume and pitch, his, his arm rubbed against a thin membrane of wing, the one that held our family together. If I were the female, the I would have no voice. I would compose it out of tree branches scraped together like sticks for fire, a flame voice trying to sing Adonai or a leather belt whipped against air. But before it reaches a body, it becomes pliable and wing-like a cricket returning. I am the song and the open window. Um, okay. okay. Um, this um, poem is a pretty new, relatively new poem. It begins with a um, line from John Ashbery, uh, a poem by his called Baked Alaska. It was uh, published in the New Yorker in 92. Hollows. And when the hectic light leaches upward into rolls of dark cloud, when all I want is to shut the door or wear a mask to face it, all I want is to reveal what is inside, not red leaves, this pandemic, a woman in love, but a sliver of autumn, one of its dreary days when leaves are soaked and scattered, one of the masked waiting for something, maybe all hollows, which I know nothing about, except children and nightmares parade and floats, or inside red wagons dragged by mothers or fathers. And like one of its leaves, hang on, hang on, as though my life depends on it when all I want is to rely on a small wagon of promise. I will fall, my darling, into my own arms because you are not here. You are something like wind, something like the angel asking for treats, something like autumn air holding me up. Okay. Am I um, okay, Charles? A couple more minutes, Charles?
I don't hear you, dear. Are you muted? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, yes, you have about another 11 minutes that you can use. Okay. Okay. Or nine precise. I love it. <laughs> One day we are fields. One day we are fields. Wake to the sun's flash of denial. What words are remembered when blinded? I swear not grief. The problem, I am grief's land, whatever it plants. Oops. Wait, I'm sorry. I'm going to start that again. Forgive me. I just realized I had the wrong copy. Well, guys, you just learned something about me. I'm rather disorganized, but I'll be right back. Thank you. I may not be able to read that one. Jeez. Okay. I'm going to read it then. Forgive me, I'm going to start again. One day we are fields. Wake to the sun's flash of denial. What words are remembered when blinded? I swear, not grief. The problem, I am grief's land, whatever it plants. I want this for you, to be a seed that withstands drought, or at the very least, a field where a girl can rest. One day I am a hawk's meadow, one day a hollow. One day, slowly, soundlessly, a meadow called bereft. Above a red-tailed hawk fools me into thinking he's an eagle, flaps his wings wildly, then glides until I know you. One day, a long depression of land, a hollow carved out close to a river. You bring me rain, carry it in your mouth as if I were a baby bird. You make many trips, squat beside me. There were never enough words between us. Before you leave, you cover me with birch bark. Say you are safe now. Um, I think I'll read... One or two more, if that works. That's fine, Amy. Thank you. I have the wrong copy of that poem. <laughs> I'm sorry. I wrote this actually before um, Russell died. Breath. Music on the vintage radio as falling leaves stopped in midair. Air reveals itself for the first time as a body or a car leaving a driveway. If this doesn't make sense, look out the window as air waits for snow. Air knows what is worth waiting for and what is not. I want to be air, wait with brilliant patience, unafraid. I know it as air knows snow, as a body knows air when it cannot catch its breath. If able, every day we breathe in at least 16 kilograms of it. This is not wisdom. This is eating boiled eggs, buttered toast, food reassuring as snow. Animals need to eat, true? Need to breathe the oxygen in air. Don't conflate air with oxygen. That's a mistake. We also breathe in its poisons. Too much kills. That is the problem with air and love. I don't want to live without either. I mean, it is impossible. What is beautiful about air is how it helps to move water from vapor to ice to sublime again. Holds my love as he tries to transfer from couch to table and back to couch. Knows he will be ice and vapor. This is what we all become. 
And I'm going to end with a short one. This poem I wrote after um, poking around the, the British Museum online and noticed an Aboriginal Australian canoe model from 1851 and how, of course, very few Aboriginal people remain in Tasmania due to the effects of the British colonization. I wrote this um, in part for Robbie Nestor. It's now part of her marvelous anthology called the um, Plague Papers. I picked the, a museum for Robbie, but once again, the subject surprised me. Here was a tiny canoe, a wooden canoe. And yet, that's my timer. And yet I still ended up talking about grief. Before the world ends, I will put on shoes with cork soles, carry him along our tree-lined streets. He'll be heavy. We will make it to the river, float in water, not earth, not trench and stone. I want sun in our mouths as calm as sea cakes, him to drift beside me into the night, even when the gate is shut behind us. Time enough to become two slight boats built from paper bark, moored together in parting. Thank you. Well, thank you. That, that was wonderful. There was one line, <laughs> there were so many wonderful lines, but there was one in particular that kind of encapsulated your poetry and the poetry of grief. And the line was, I am Greece land where it plants whatever it wants. I'm paraphrasing maybe part of it. And I, I you know, as I was listening to your poems, um, that really struck me as probably, and I hate to use the word metaphor, it's a great image and metaphor for, uh, you know, for grief, uh, because it's unpredictable of what, you know, is going to come. It's unpredictable of how we're going to react each day. Uh, to this burden, uh, you know, that we carry. And to say that, you know, you're in their land. And even you used another um, another uh, image where you say you're in the, uh, uh, yes, you were in their dark. I and mean, that's what I remember. The comfort of the dark. Oh, and I, I, just felt, yes. I just felt that that was such a, a marvelous uh, way, because if you're expressing yourself, if you are coming to grips with it, there is a certain comfort to that. You know, there's a certain comfort in being that. It's not all chaos, and I guess it's not all hellish that when you, you come to this place, that there's a certain way that you kind of settle into it. And so th th there were just two marvelous pieces of uh, that that came through uh, this poet, these poems. And I'm, you know, I'm hoping that you know poets love this, but other people can find within this genre and within these poems a way, you know, a way to walk with it, the way to live in that dark that you're talking about, the way to live in that land <laughs> that you know plants whatever it wants in you. Um, we don't have control over it necessarily and as much as we, we try. But Amy, this has been wonderful. Uh, I know our, uh, I loved it. I'm sure our audience did also. And so I'm glad that we could finally bring this, bring this together. Uh, so I also, of course, have to thank Moonstone for, you know, I'm in, I'll be in my fifth a year of the Philly Loves Poetry, and um, people have been so supportive. And so this is a, a you know, a really wonderful series. And, um, and so I say to people, the people that are listening and people are viewing, is that the Moonstone Art Center is still 
alive and well, although a lot of their events are virtual, although Larry keeps, you know, pumping out these uh, anthologies and these books and these events, uh, which is really great. But, you know, we need uh, people's support to continue to do this. Uh, and so people are not walking into a physical facility. They're in a virtual uh, studio or a virtual bar, or whatever it is now to participate in this. So I, I urge people to go to moonstoneartscenter.org and see ways that you can help and support us uh, because uh, no organization like this can just continue without that kind of support. So, um, and be as generous uh, as you as you can be. So once again, Amy, I thank you very much for this. Uh, it was uh, very delightful, very enlightening, and uh, I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. <laughs> I thank you so much for having me. It, it was wonderful. Thank you. Okay. Look forward to seeing you. Mm -hmm. Okay.